Thursday morning broadcast from Jerusalem. My name is Nachum Siegel, and this is America's one and only Jewish Moments in the Morning Radio program heard on listeners' sponsored digital radio. Around the world, the web at NachumSiegel.com, on the Nachum Siegel Network, and of course on the beloved NSN app. We're here in Jerusalem in our temporary studio at the Inbal Hotel, and we are honored to welcome Jonathan Pollard into this uh, studio, and uh, it's the first time we've ever spoken with him, and uh, we're very honored that he has agreed to this, uh, what I hope will be a full-length interview and a conversation, no doubt, about current events and some of the other events of the last 30-plus years. A pleasure to welcome you to JM and the AM. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mazel Tov on your third anniversary of living in the city of Jerusalem. Am I right? It was just a few weeks ago. No, it was the third it's, anniversary? it's the third, and it's also a little over the first anniversary of my, my marriage. Mazal Tov. So, to Rivka. Right. So. And um, I would also say a Mazal Tov on the eighth anniversary of you being paroled. And I don't know how you looked at that, because I know you probably wanted to go directly to Israel and not spend time in the United States, but uh, it was a significant event, you'd have to agree. It was, it was a significant event, but it was leaving a conventional prison with walls and razor wire to go to an unconventional type of living with uh, geographic restrictions and a GPS and all that. What was not funny, but it was ironic was all of my friends were complaining bitterly when we had the lockdown. And I said, well, welcome to my world. <laughs> I said, it's not a problem for me. Um, bars on the window looked familiar. Uh, wow. Had to be in a small space, felt familiar. You know, of course, the major difference was I had my wife with me, which made all the difference. So, yeah, it was... Um, it was disappointing. Because freedom is freedom, but restrictions does not equal freedom. Yeah, it was actually scarier for me in New York than it was in prison. Because in prison, I kind of knew everybody. I knew who to be afraid from, who to avoid. I could carry a weapon. Um, but you in, could carry a weapon, meaning? A knife. Actually, two knives. And, and you mean and, that in a legal sense you were able to no, carry? No. In an no. illegal sense? Everybody or? did. The only way to protect themselves. It was the only way to protect yourself. So in New York, um, I couldn't have anything, not even a gas gun. There was one incident that happened that was very troubling. And uh, a guy in Manhattan, in Manhattan on uh, 3rd Avenue. And a guy just stepped out of the shadows and confronted me and threatening me to kill me. I looked at him and, oh, crew cut, squared away, military. Wow. And, and you uh, were alone? Well, no. Esther was with me, and I looked back at her for a second, and there was a guy behind us. So I told her, get, get, get behind me close and keep your eye on the guy behind us. So uh, I realized, you know, I had to get a little aggressive. And in prison, what you do is you look at somebody's hands you don't look at their face, and you don't listen to what they're saying. You watch their hands. The hands show us their intent. Their intent. And so his hands were still down, out. So I just started pushing him hard, and he didn't expect that. And I don't think he knew what to do at that point. And he was threatening to kill me and kill my wife, and you know, it was very uncomfortable. But uh, I saw some cops... And I went for them, and he disappeared. He and his friend disappeared. So um, there was, I'm not going to mention his name, but there was a nice Jewish captain that showed up from the local precinct. And, uh, well, it was a hate crime because, uh, bias crime, he was saying some really uh, anti-Semitic things to me. It was clear that he was trying to get me, to provoke me, to do something. So he'd have... Well, Re reason to attack. Reason, but yeah. more importantly, if I were involved in any physical altercation, I go straight back to finish um, fifteen more years, day for day. Essentially, a violation of your parole. Correct. So what happened was they eventually looked at all the cameras 
from the banks in that area. And they were all blank for that time frame. And Shockingly I, enough. And I went into the precinct, and he was sitting there, and he said, uh, you're not going to believe this. I said, they're all blank? He said, uh, yeah, every one of them. So uh, Ron Dermer um, made a formal complaint to the State Department over what happened. It was clear that it was a, uh, a setup. authorized right. uh, setup. It was a provocation. And he said, point blank, if it happens again, you know, there are going to be diplomatic consequences. And luckily, um, it didn't happen again. It, right. was, it was okay. So we hear how you survived in New York City. How did you survive in prison, especially at the very beginning, the first few years, when you're just learning, it sounds like, who to avoid, how to operate, the modus operandi in general? It, I would imagine that in the, in the, in the early part, it must have been frightening not having that information well, yet. First of all, there's, um, I have an ability to switch your, my mindset depending on my environment, luckily. So my first uh, seven years were uh, 150 meters underground, um, isolation. Oh, the entire seven years isolation? Yeah, the entire time. And it was uh, pretty tough. Um, being by yourself, you would think it would be easier than with a bunch of murderers. And, but, but it's the most dangerous time to be with because you have seemingly no hope. So when I came there, um, the warden came out and said, uh, look at the sky, look at the grass, breathe the air. The next time you come up, you'll be an old man in a body bag. So if you don't talk, this was like for people that didn't talk. And um, I said, well, God runs the world. We'll, you know, and he said, well, we'll see. Okay, so I had to become reacquainted with Hashem down there. I was off the derech before then for various reasons. And I realized that I couldn't uh, do this myself. I needed help if I were going to keep my mouth shut. And I certainly wasn't going to commit. I, they suggested if you don't want to talk, you can use the bar over the door. Just hang yourself. You, know, you can leave easily. And I tried to explain to them that Jews don't commit suicide. We uh, buy retail instead. <laughs> That's what we're known for. <laughs> That's what we're known for. But, but uh, the joke was lost on him. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, completely <laughs> lost on him. Okay. So I had a discussion with a Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, kind of like uh, Avram Avinu with Hashem negotiating for Sidon. Come on. And uh, I negotiated with him. Lehavdil, <laughs> lehavdil. Um, and I said, if I do these five things and I don't do these five things, uh, save me. And he did. And uh, seven years later, I came up. It literally into the light. Everybody else had committed suicide. And seven years is significant in Jewish uh, Yes, it lore. is. Quite. Yeah. Quite. So one of the first things I asked was, what year is it? Seriously. Yeah. So I came up, and uh, he was there, the same warden. And sometimes I have a problem with time and place. <laughs> this was the wrong time and the wrong place <laughs> to finally open my mouth, but I had to. And I said to him, I mean, I'm all trussed up, like a Thanksgiving turkey. And I just looked up at this monster of a guy, and I said, you see, I told you, God runs the world. And I lost a tooth, and he knocked me out, but it was the sweetest pain I ever had. I really got him mad, and uh, he charged me with incitement to riot. And this was kind of funny, because every warden I've ever come across, and there were many, called me in and said, how, how could you have incited a riot? You were outside under how many guns they didn't know, trussed up, um, there wasn't any inmate around. They just eventually tore it up. I mean, they said, this is ridiculous. 
that was the only uh, shot I ever got in 30 years. That was the only infraction I right. got. And um, it was difficult when I went to the next prison because there were a lot of people who were getting killed there. Is this already Butner we're talking about? Butner, yeah. North Carolina? North Carolina, yeah. I mean, everybody thinks the feds, you know, are club fed. Well, it's not that way. I don't care what prison you go to. It's dangerous. Even a camp right. can be very, very dangerous uh, because you don't know who and what you're dealing with. So a major problem I had there was um, kashrut. How do I... I couldn't get kosher food. They didn't have kosher food for me. And the commissary was expensive. I didn't have very much money. I was working. And um, I had to scramble. And there were many times I didn't have anything to eat. And I was actually thankful that I didn't have anything to eat. Why? Because this is um, the service you go through to maintain your Yiddishkeit. And I was and you thankful. Were happy to be. I was very happy to do that. I was very happy. So, okay, eventually, 15 years later... From they, your entrance into Butner. Yeah, I'm still there. And uh, they get meal mart. <laughs> common fare. And the problem with that was that the uh, individuals in the kitchen were opening up the packages and taking the chicken or the meat or the fish out and then retaping it. I can't eat it. It's treif at that point. So I just kept scrounging for food. And um, it was okay. You know, al kiddush Hashem. It's fine. Do you remember where, one of the things about you that we've been uh, told that we read about is that you have a phenomenal memory. That's what people say about okay, you. Okay, I, 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 have, I have to quickly say something. Um, a congressional friend of mine, whom I will not mention, came under a little opprobrium for his scandalous behavior um, from New York. <laughs> <laughs> we might know who you mean. Um, he was a Sadiq with me. I can't tell you how much he did for me, for no gain at all because it was the right thing to do. And a lot of people you know, may not like me saying this, but good and bad can coexist sometimes in the same people. And um, to the extent they're bad, they can also, also be good. Some would say in every person, frankly, that there's... Well, you know, to an extent, not right. in this... Right, this extreme, extent. right. Yeah, this is a bit extreme. Right. Um, but in this case, he was very helpful uh, and s successful in getting a document that basically the government admitted that uh, they knew I didn't have a photographic mind. That was one of their concerns originally, was Correct. that you had a photographic mind and Correct. therefore there's no eliminating and, the information. And, and, and that there it is in black and white. That, that you don't I, have it. And they, well, that, that, that they knew. Right. That they knew. Right. Second of all, that they knew that I wasn't... I didn't even know government makes an evaluation like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that the, the second important thing was that they knew that I was not in the same category as the Soviet spies. And so when the question was asked, why did you make this? And they said, well, we wanted to make sure we put them away. Part of the problem right. was that we didn't know at the time what they were that uh, Alger James and Robert Hansen right. had accused me of being responsible for all the deaths of the CIA and MI6 agents that had, were ongoing in uh, the uh, Soviet Union. So Robert, um, John Loftus, came to see me and he asked me, he Amazing said, guy. when you were in court and the judge asked you, um, did you have any regret for all the deaths you caused? Where was your head? I said, Tunis. Well, I was the intelligence officer that put together the airstrike, the Israeli airstrike to kill Arafat. And we missed him. Right. This was in retaliation for a brutal 
uh, terrorist attack in Larnaca right. to, to Israeli civilians. So the planes went overhead, demolished his headquarters, killed about 90 of his 417 people who had carried out the terrorist attack. We missed him. So I, I answered the judge. I said, yes, I have remorse. And he looked at me. I said that we didn't get one more. So John asked me, you know, your head was in Tunis? I said, where, what, where else would it be? He said, the basement of the Lefortovo prison in Moscow. I said, what am I doing there? He said, uh, Ames had just described to the judge, ex parte, in his chambers, what happened to General Trechikov, a.k.a. his codename was Tricycle, fed feet first into the furnace in the basement of the Lefortovo in front of his family. And he said, now you're telling the judge you just wish there was one more? I said, what did I have to do with the Soviet Union? I, don't, I, I didn't have anything to do. He said, well, Ames wrapped you up pretty carefully in that. Right. Can I just tell you that as all this is going on, the public that was concerned about you, one of the arguments that we always made was that your sentence was so much harsher than other international spies, or um, those accused of being it, it international was, spies. It was. But now as you give us this perspective... We There's sh- one more perspective on that. Um, just to finish this, John asked me, did you notice how much security was in the courtroom? I said, it was amazing. I never saw so many heavily armed marshals before. He said, well, there was a reason for that. Um, There were many operations directorate field agents from the CIA that were volunteering to come in and kill you in the courtroom. But I said, I didn't do this. And he said, well, that's irrelevant. And when they finally found out, uh, Senator DeConcini, who was the then chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee had a bipartisan letter that he submitted to Clinton saying, you, you got the wrong guy. Let him go. Well, as it was explained to him, I was valuable as a bargaining chip right. for Clinton. Right. That, was, that whole issue with the Russians was one thing, or the Soviets. John said point blank, I didn't have what's called the red stripe clearance or blue stripe clearances to get into the lists of agents. And if you want to hear irony of irony, the first time I met Rafi Eitan, not the chief of staff, but my control officer in Paris, he asked me for a list of all the American agents in Israel. And I said, no, thank God I said, no, that's not what this operation is about. So he said, I'm telling you, one of them is going to kill you. I said, so be it. But I'm not going to compromise an American agent. And thank God I didn't. Granted, one of them, a CIA plant in the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, uh, outed me. I found out because he took the CIA to court in New York for inadequate retirement. He was responsible for catching the notorious spy he didn't like his retirement package. Somebody who was planted in the Israeli Knesset. Yes. Kind of raises the issue of hypocrisy. Oh. Okay. So that whole Soviet issue was one matter. The other matter was that I was, unfortunately, um, very, I was integrally involved with Iran-Contra from the Israeli side. I opened up most of the bank accounts in Switzerland, um, they needed a fresh face that no one would know. It's, it was a Safra bank that was used by all of the intelligence agencies. So they put me out in the open. I mean, it was insane to open up these accounts for both Israelis and Americans. This is where this whole issue of my Swiss bank account came. I didn't have the Swiss bank. I opened it up. And eventually, the tax court, after I was sentenced to life, brought this issue up. And they all wanted to know who I opened the accounts up for, the Americans especially. Which Americans did you open up an account for? Let me be very clear about this. 
all of the Americans that I that they unknowingly worked with me on this case, uh, Iran Contra, were patriots. They didn't make any money on this. This wasn't a business deal for them. They were patriots. They were American patriots, and I just didn't feel that I should compromise them. I never ratted anybody out, and I wasn't going to start doing it there for people that I actually respected. Right. So basically they said, okay, um, we know that this isn't your account because we have it from the bank. You couldn't get back into the account. Mm -hmm. You could open it, but that was it. I said, okay. And they said, no. You tell us the names or we're going to say this is your account. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to talk. So they said, well, for the next half hour before you're reincarcerated, you're going to be a very rich man <laughs> because the bank account is yours. And I was privileged and honored many, many years later after I got out uh, on parole to meet two of the people that I basically um, had the honor of protecting. Right and will continue to protect even though one of them is now dead. This, this segment began with me commenting about your memory, and I think I've proven my point based on your response, frankly, but, but let me ask but you. Wait, but wait, yes. wait, there's <laughs> more. There's yeah. more behind door number two. <laughs> yes. Just a second, wait. Um, there are all types of memory, a photographic memory. Right. I've learned quite right. a bit but since the then. No, 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 wait, 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 Rega. Um, People, some people can remember pictures. Every aspect of a picture. Some people can remember faces. Maybe not the names, but the faces. And there's some people that can remember precisely what they read. There are all kinds of photographic memories. I remember when they accused me in court of having a photographic memory. Uh, I turned to my lawyer and I said in a very loud voice, what is my name and what am I doing in here? It's a joke. I mean, I had to joke. This is like in court in New York. Um, the last court case I was in where the judge mm, accused me of being the most dangerous man in America. I remember that quote. Do right. you remember that? I remember that quote. Yeah. And when I got outside, well, I started laughing in court. So she said, you know, is there something funny? Do you want to tell, tell me what's so funny? Mm -hmm. I said, nothing that I, 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 I want to repeat because I could be held in contempt. Well, she didn't get it until a few seconds later. You know, I was talking about her. Yeah. Well, it was too late. So when I got outside, um, there was a reporter that came up to me and said, you know, Jonathan, the judge just characterized you as the most dangerous man in America. How, what's your response? So I looked at my lawyer uh, Elliot Lauer is a great guy. And um, he said, go, go ahead, <laughs> just say what you want. So I said, look, the only thing I represent a threat to is a hot pastrami sandwich, that's all. <laughs> and okay, that's, again, you survive by a sense of humor. Oh, I get that. I but, mean, But I asked you about your memory because I'm curious if you remember the majority or would you even argue most or all of the visits you had in prison? I, if I, I told you a random story about a visit, would, would, it, would it likely mean something to you or not? I have no idea. I don't want to... Were there thousands of people who came to see you? Hundreds? No, How many? No, no. They were, they were restricted on who could come. Did you see 10 a year, 100 a year? I mean... Uh, honestly, it's, it's hard to say. Maybe, you know, Esther came all the time. Um, Rabbi Pesach Lerner, who was... I don't know. We never would have lived without him. He, he was our connection to you, frankly. He came all the time. Um, there were some other people that came routinely to see me. I mentioned this because a friend of mine went to see you, at, who actually lives in one of the quote-unquote settler communities of Israel. I don't know if you remember this visit or not. And um, the, the people that escorted the visitors into your room or the room where you met were generally not friendly to your visitors, right? I, no. I, I, right, that's how it was described to me. They were yeah. not people, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't schmooze with them on the way in. However, this person 
uh, had carried with him into your visit, which was illegal. I don't think anybody was allowed to carry anything into a visit. But he snuck in a card, uh, an ID card of his father, who served as a, an officer in the United States Air Force. And he showed this to the gentleman that escorted him into the room. And they thought it was him? They didn't think it was, I don't know if they thought it was him, they, maybe they did, but they instantly, he was able, he claims he was able to start a conversation with the person no, because, because he had a measure were, of respect for him. Well, most of them were ex-military to begin with. Meaning those, the, the, the ones guarding you, etc. Yeah, most of the guards so, were ex-military. So he's able to strike up a conversation that asks him, asks him, what is the story here with, with Jonathan? Like, what is the... What is the eventuality? What is the, from your point of view, what's the assessment? And he said, and I could put you in touch with this gentleman. He said to him, we never expected him to live this long. We never expected him to be able to endure what has been done to him. And based on what you told me about your first seven years, and then the likely, you know, unpleasant experience after that, you could understand where he was coming from. There were many instances that I thought it was over. Um, when people ask me, was it more dangerous in open population or isolation? I said, no, isolation was far because you're fighting yourself in your claustrophobia and your fear of being buried alive and all of these things. So that was more uncomfortable for me than it was being out in the open with a bunch of murderers. Um, you know, yeah, I saw a lot of very bad things I saw a lot of good things as well in prison, um, virtuous things by people you wouldn't expect to exhibit those kinds of qualities, character qualities. How do you know they don't have an, an, an ulterior motive when they're doing something nice for you? Or? It wasn't nice to me. There was a man in our unit who was dying of pancreatic cancer. That's very painful. <laughs> And he had embarrassed the prison system by breaking out of virtually every prison they put him in without harming anybody. So, yeah, he robbed a bank with the warden's car and parked the car. You know, they arrested the warden. It, they, he was a pretty funny guy, but he was dying in great pain. They wouldn't give him any painkillers. So one night, you know, he was begging for people to kill him just to put him, he didn't have enough strength to do it. So I came and sat down next to him, I held his hand, and I said, um, look, you have to live. It's very important that you live another day. And he said, why? And I said, because it's another day to thank God, to bless God. And he looked at me like I was from Mars. And all of a sudden, this other guy who had done almost 40 years in prison, Drug charge, wouldn't talk. Ripped a pain patch off his arm. He was dying of cancer. Vicodin patch. And it leaves, if you rip it off, it leaves in a, a, a blue mark. And that's five years day for day. And he was getting out in two weeks to go home to die with the remnants of his family in his own house. And we all looked at him and he said, I said, what did you do? You're going, you're going home. You know, by our standards, an honest man, you, you kept your mouth shut. You didn't cause anybody any, any harm. He said, I can't, after I heard what you said, um, he said, I'm going to die soon, and I have to have one good thing. I can tell God that I did to make up for this horrible life. Alleviating that I've man's had. pain. Correct. So he put the pain patch on, and... Okay, within an hour he was arrested and ratted him out. Somebody ratted him out. So the next day, almost everybody on the compound, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, was lining up in the um, internal security office to plead for this guy. Don't charge him. Let him go home. I'd never seen anything like that before. So when I came in and sat down. The guy looked at me and said, what do you, you don't talk to us. What are you doing here? And I explained it, and he said, you see that shredded paper on the floor? I said, yeah. He said, that's the charge. I can't, in good faith, charge this guy with what he did. He said, I've never seen it before. So when he left, about two weeks later, everybody came out, to basically, to say goodbye. 
which if you knew prison poli racial politics, that doesn't happen. But for this one moment of decency and altruism and real compassion, everybody came out. So that's the good thing. I don't want to go into the bad things right. because I'll let your imagination take care of that. But this, ish, this incident um, is what I like to take away from my with my prison experience did you know that did you know beforehand that you had the fortitude to survive those 30 years I, I i say that in the context of today we were discussing off the air earlier how a lot of people who are in these very sensitive situations right now especially here in israel idf soldiers hostage families etc they are learning something about themselves that they probably did not know in advance did you know going in that you could that you had what it takes of course not no, but nobody does. Um, that's why when that door shut and I'm in a small room, 150 meters underground, nothing to read, nothing to write, no one to see. I mean, you're buried alive and there's only two ways out and one of which, well, both of which you can't do. Um, that's when you either give in to despair or you reach for a higher power. That's beyond you. You know, there's an old statement, and I didn't understand it until I got out of that hole, that bore, that um, a man who had gone through, it's an apocryphal story, but a man who had gone through terrible ordeals um, had a talk with God. He said that, you know, sometimes when I was walking along the beach, I only saw my own footprints. And God answered him by saying, no, that's when I was carrying you. And that's how you felt. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like walking in the streets of Jerusalem today? What is that feeling like? What would you how would you describe it to someone? I'm reborn. Reborn. In a very Jewish sense. In a very, very Jewish sense. I mean, this is my reward. To be a free person in our own land. Were you worried you'd never be part of that reward or see that reward or experience that reward? Did I think I would? Well, look, at one point, John Kerry proposed a deal as Secretary of State. We're talking about what year now? I honestly can't remember. Which year, <laughs> but when, <laughs> he, approximation when, when he was uh, <laughs> Secretary of State, and what he did was propose that um, I would be released in exchange for some horrible terrorists here right and by the way one of dozens of deals that we've read about in advance of this conversation and there were dozens and dozens that were very close and dozens that a lot of people took credit for that i don't know if you would give them the same i don't credit. know i mean i was packed out ready to go many times many many times more than just the clinton netanyahu uh... many, many times the fact the first person that um secured my release was um, Yitzhak Rabin. Everything was arranged. After the uh, signing of the Jordanian peace treaty in the Rose Garden, I was to come home. He arranged it. And he was assassinated. And when Shimon Peres, as Rosh Memsla, as the prime minister, came to Clinton and said, you know, I would like Jonathan to come home now, Clinton's answer was, that deal was with your predecessor. So I want you to release four or 500 Palestinian terrorists. So he was still willing to do it, but the he, buses, he increased. The buses, the buses were blowing up. In, and Perez said, I, I can't do that. That's impossible. And Clinton said, that's the deal. This is mid-90s. Yeah. You're, you're a victim of circumstance yeah. of what's going on here in Israel at that time. And, um, okay, so. So Kerry, you were saying. Pardon? Kerry, you were talking about the Kerry deal. Yeah, see my memory. <laughs> Kerry. I overestimated so, you. I apologize. Thank you. What? <laughs> Boo? What am I doing here? <laughs> um, and, but that the, was Stockdale's but, quote, by the way. Uh, yeah. Admiral Stockdale was the yeah. one with Oh, the, that was horrible. During that vice presidential debate. Did you watch debate, that? Yeah. Did they let you watch Who TV am I there? and what am I doing here? They well, let you watch? What happens is you go to the officer and you want to talk to him about something and you keep looking at the TV. <laughs> there are tricks you learn about things wow. like this. All right. So go ahead. Kevin. So um, 
the the catch was I would never be allowed to go home. You'd stay Israel. in the United States, even if I'm I died. The body has to stay in uh, the U.S. The U.S. So BB in the cabinet meeting put it to Esther, Alei Shalom. Um, you have to bring this deal to Jonathan, and whatever he agrees with, okay, we'll we'll abide by. Well, some people might say that it's unethical to bring an offer like that to a man in my position at the time who had no hope at all of getting out. Okay. But Bibi knew me well enough. It wasn't a risk he was taking. <laughs> all right. So Esther came, Alayshalom, and she described this whole situation to me. And she said, before you answer, I want you to know something. That whether you decide to stay in prison here or take the deal and come out never to return to Eretz Yisrael, I will stay with you in the Midbar. That's why that quote from Tehillim I put over her grave. I knew you in your youth when you were in the Midbar. So I looked at her and I said, um, okay, I'll give you my answer. No. On the spot, you said right, no. no. She said, look, I need a little bit longer answer. I'm, I have to More brief, explanation. I have to brief the cabinet. So I said, okay, hell no. That was your uh, was the long it. version. <laughs> yeah. So she said, look, you're supposedly an educated person. <laughs> give me an educated <laughs> answer that doesn't make me look like an idiot when I go back. So I said, okay. There are three reasons why I can't accept this. One, it devalues the lives of the victims. Second of all, it lowers deterrence because Deals. they look at Deals what's happening now. Right. Deals okay. lower deterrence. Right. The third reason is it would cause immeasurable pain to the victims' families that I didn't have the strength to just honor their korbanot. So I said, for those three reasons, I, can't, I have to say no. So she looked at me and she said, that's a very good answer, but it's not the Jewish answer. She was my mora, Esther, so I listened. She studied with Rav Emanuel Shochet in Canada. Um, most rabbis I know who knew her said that if uh, the rabbinate was ever open, the orthodox rabbinate was ever open to women, she would probably be the first one given smicha. So I said, okay, what's the Jewish answer? And she said, as Jews, we live for... Eretz Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Al Pitorat Yisrael. Those are our three principles that we organize our life around as nationalist Jews. Halacha is a little different, but these are, as a nationalist Jew, this is what we live for. And she said, if you decided to stay in the Midbar, you would be making the same mistake that the Meraglim made when they cursed the land in order to maintain their COVID in the Midbar. And she said, we've been paying for that ever since. So she said, when you go before Kodesh Baruch Hu, however long you have to live, but when you go before him, he doesn't have to ask you, why did you forsake my land that I gave to your, you, you people? Why? She said, you won't have to answer that. So she said, you have two choices on how to come home. You can come home an old man in a body bag and be buried in Knesset Yisrael. Or she said, you can come home as an old man and kiss the ground. Those are your two choices. And I said, well, can I come home as a slightly younger man? <laughs> and, you know, Not so old. Is a, you know, go to uh, the, the, you know, in, uh, in Hebron and uh, you know, thank God for saving me. And she said, no, those are your choices. And I said, fine, put my name on it. So that's who and what she was. And um, so I had some cabinet members try to ask me directly at the time, um, can't you be a little bit more accommodating? Flexible. Flexible. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry. I mean, I see life in black and white especially here 
when when Esther was dying, literally, and I was holding her, counting her breaths until there weren't any more, she said, take my mask off. I was in the COVID ICU. I was the first and only one that was allowed in. Um, I, had to, I was in an Army chemical warfare suit, and the head nurse said, you can't leave here for 72 hours or 80 hours. However long she's alive, you can't live. If you have to go to the bathroom, you do it in this suit. She can't take it off. So, all right, I was, I, God gave me 72 hours with her to take care of her at the end. Thank, thank God. It was a madhouse in there of people screaming for their mothers, their wives, their children. I mean, it was a level of hell I didn't even, Dante wouldn't have even recognized. So she's, I took her mask off, and she said, take your mask off. Take it off. And I had nothing at that moment left to live for, so no problem. I took my whole hood off. And she said, listen to me. When I'm gone, they're coming for you. And I knew who she meant, the politicians. And she, she was the gatekeeper. So she said, um, what is politics? Now this woman is dying. She has minutes to live, and this is what she's talking about to me. What is politics? And I said, sweetheart, you're not going to live long enough for me to give you the full academic <laughs> definition. She laughed kind of mirthlessly. And she said, politics is the art of compromise. What are you willing to compromise? Maharat HaMachpela, Tekoa, Har Habayit, um, Kever Rachel, Kever Yosef, Kashrut, Shabbat. What are you willing to compromise? And I said to her, nothing. I won't compromise anything. And she said, remember that. Don't ever compromise. Wow. And then she went downhill. Wow. Seconds after that, she went downhill. So yet another explanation for us about some of the positions you take that are hard, ironclad, and you simply have no desire to, I won't, to move I, in one direction no, or the other. No, I, I will not be moved. I know what's right. If I have a question, I go ask Das Torah from rabbis that I deeply respect, Pesach Lerner being one of them. Well, for a good reason. For a very good reason. Um, if we, and again, remember, I'm growing up through the whole Pollard situation. Right. right? I'm now 60. You, you are 69. <laughs> you're 69. I'm and going to be and, 70 and, soon. And you imagine, <laughs> I, I was probably around 20, 25 years old when mm -hmm. all this becomes known to the public and Pollard becomes an issue right. in the Jewish world. And um, every single step of the way, we are shown that everyone, government, CIA, FBI, I'm throwing around organizations, I don't know exactly what they do in your regard, but you know, we're convinced that they're going to use every opportunity to keep you incarcerated, to give you a life sentence, to be Correct. completely unfair on every step of the way compared to other sentences. I mean, these are the arguments. You heard, you heard all these arguments. How is it possible, I ask you then, that they didn't figure out a way to keep you in after 30 years? They couldn't find a way to actually prove some small, some violation in the 30 years you're in the system that would have kept all these guys, whether it's Weinbergers, Rabritsky, and all, all of them, in, in the State Department happy that you're still in jail. At one point, excuse me, sir. At one point, Edward Black, the noted historian, interviewed Weinberger on the occasion of his memoirs being published. And Weinberger, Ed asked him about my case. Why Just wasn't lift I... The, lift the mic across. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Why wasn't my name mentioned in his memoirs? So he said, well, it was because the Pollard affair was a minor matter. Made more important... To Casper Weinberger? Yeah, he said this. Made more important than it was. So Ed, you know, like, what? In the what? Jewish world, we felt it was the number one thing on his list. Yeah. No. So Ed said, why? I mean, this is contrary to what you wrote the judge. And he said, uh, you know, powers above me made that decision. Like, who's above him? The president? He, he, he made it up. But he's again passing the buck. So... 
he died shortly that, after that interview. So we went to the um, ethics division of the Justice Department and said, you know, come on. It's clear that he perjured himself a second time. First was Iran-Contra, now this. And they, their attitude was water under the bridge. They didn't want to touch it. There were many instances where things that were char alleged that I had done were, were disproven conclusively. Even Tenet, the then head of the CIA, right. the director, who had no love for me, admitted that um, there was no evidence that any of the information that I had passed to Israel had been compromised to anybody else. Wow. Okay, that's kind of important. The fact that, here's this thing. Nobody reads my indictment. If you read my indictment, it says... They don't said, know what you're accused of. Or what I'm accused of. It says in black and white, I acted without intent to harm the United States. Wow. You know, intent is very important in the law. So here, it's the government saying that. So when I finally, after 20 years, got my, a document that showed exactly what harm I had done. It took me 20 years to get it. And I understood why when I saw it. What did the government actually say that, I, that we didn't know about? Well, they had to be pretty accurate for the judge, right? So what they said was, I angered our Arab allies in the Middle East by, in their estimation, by making Israel too strong. Alavai. And that the information that I did give Israel, while it was supposed to have been given, right. resulted in the United States losing negotiating advantage. Okay, I'm sorry. That's not the stuff of the most dangerous man in the, in the United States. Right. So back to my question. Can we find something wrong that happened in those 30 years or not? <laughs> except, except, again, remember, God runs the world. So what happened? What actually happened? The Jik the Jikpoa, the deal with Iran. There were a group of senators that were meeting with um, an individual from the White House who didn't want to sign on to all of this. So this guy came to meet them. What did he talk about? He said the president has decided that Pollard would be on parole. Oh. Wow. It, it completely deflected everything. Why? How did this happen? What, you know, what happened? What happened was the announcement of my eventual release on parole was accompanied by a barrage of anti-Israel statements that I was the worst spy, had done it, immense damage, that uh, it was typical of the Israelis, of what they, we were, we're so kind to them, we give them everything, and look, they put a spy in our midst, and look at the damage that he's, I mean, it was all over again, recycled. So it was an attempt, and we've gotten this later from, uh, confirmed by people in the government, that it was an effort by the Obama White House to blacken Israel by using me. And to keep you in prison, essentially. No, no. They were going to release me. But they wanted me out so that they could basically point to me. They could get reporters to come near me and ask me provocative questions, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the, the news surrounding the report of my release, it's all negative. Yeah. I mean... They wanted to paint that picture specifically. They wanted, but it wasn't of me. Israel. It was of Israel. And uh, so it was actually a Ness. It's like Balaam and Balak. They came to curse Israel. And, and, but you are telling and, me that it was a miracle. You're telling me that God runs the world and that I sort of have God, a, good, a good premise here. God That, that the way the, things were going the prior 30 years. They, I wasn't they, getting out. Right. They in were going to think of it. That's why people like me, the regular Balabas in America, were shocked that you were paroled. The first parole hearing I went to, and I had to go. I was, I was... In 2015 or much earlier? In it, was, 2015? it was about a year before. The end of 2014. 
it was a disaster. I mean, they were so negative towards me and so offensive. And you left thinking? I, there's no way. Right. In fact, at one point, the head of the National Security Directorate of the Justice Department was just absolutely blackening me. We had submitted documentation showing that I had certain uh, projects that I'd been working on in prison that would benefit the economy of the United States. And he didn't care. I mean, he was, so I finally said, can I say something? It's on TV. And Elliot Lauer, my lawyer, said, Jonathan, <laughs> no profanity, <laughs> okay? I, I thought he was going to say no jokes. No, no, right. no, this is not prison, okay? I mean, this is not a prison right. conversation, please. And I said, it's, it's okay. I looked at the guy and I said, you know what? You hate more, me more than you love the United States. And he came up, I, he, I had the right response. I mean, he came up out of his seat screaming and yelling. I was mo very gratified. So the second time we went for parole, I just thought, this is going to be a repeat performance. And next thing I know, it's directly opposite. They're talking about my release and that I have to wear a GPS and this and that. And I looked at Elliot. He was completely... Uh, Flummox, he said, where did this come from? And that's why you're saying Billum-like, because Billum. God puts the... Because it's the same people who just a few months before called, so me, harsh, right? called me everything but a white man. <laughs> that's a prison joke, by the way. Had a, that's had a right. as we're yeah, you don't have to laugh. I'm like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> well, I'm dying up here. You you know? know you're, you're not by the way, <laughs> I went to Dangerfield's once, stupidly. <laughs> And I sat in the front row. This was many, many years ago before I got arrested. And for some reason, he picked on me. Imagine that. And, um, okay. Anyway, I mean, he, yeah. was, he was a nice guy. Afterwards, I got a free watered-down drink. You know? <laughs> that was, I said to him, you know, if I wanted bottled water, I would, have, I would have asked for it. So he smelled it. He said, oh, my God. He said he went and got me a real drink. Um, Nice guy, nice guy. He said some horrible things to me. If I really gave a hell about myself, I would have been really insulted. Yeah, you see, he started preparing you for yeah, down the road. Yeah, he started preparing me for, for Imagine prison. Imagine that. Yeah, you're nothing. Yeah, I'm nothing. Um, so it was a miracle that they, they let me out. And it was a miracle. There was another miracle that happened just before um, we came to the time where they had to make a decision whether my parole was over and I could go home. Right, five years. Yeah, or, or what. And we were down to hours where they had to make a decision or else I would have to stay in and that decision would be made by the, the succeeding administration of Joe Biden. And we found out that um, they wanted to keep me in prison. Oh, so wait a with second. With another Im indictment. There Why? I never talked. They wanted me to talk. And remember that issue. And I'm going to get back to this. So I needed a passport to get out. And I said, well, I have an Israeli passport. And he said, no, as a dual national. Right, you became an Israeli you need, citizen. Right, okay, I need an American passport. State Department said, yeah, it'll take about nine months. And it was COVID, Had another two months. Yeah. So... Um, the reason I'm the, interrupting is because the rumor is that Donald Trump gets some credit here. No. Not true? No. Uh, the people that, that, first of all, Trump never objected to it. So let's... Right, give let's, him credit for that. Let's put that on the table. He never objected to it, uh, number one. Number two, uh, his chief of staff, um, who's now under the gun in Georgia. Oh, for, yeah. I, I can never see. I yeah, can never. Remember. Both of us now both are drawing can, a blank. Can. But this, <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer your name yeah, here? <laughs> but, but, but both he and his wife were in the White House. And um, Mark. Um, uh, say it? Meadows? Meadows. Meadows. Okay, I had the first name. I had the first name. I get some partial credit for I that. I like that. Um, he, I consider to be an honest, um, God fearing Christian. I, I'd never really run into one before, but he was one, he and his wife. And I'm sorry for the trouble he's in now. Misplaced, misguided loyalty. If he had, I, I asked him to stay 
as a congressman from North Carolina. And he said, I can control him. I said, anytime you, anybody, has to say, I can control the president of the United States, you better rethink that. They're fooling themselves. Okay. So it was Mark Meadows, wow. Ron Dermer, Ron Dermer, um, and Miriam and Sheldon Adelson. Of course, Esther Pesach, Kodesh Baruch Hu. They all played roles in this. You don't mention BB and you don't mention Trump. These no, are the four that you no. give the credit Those to. Those were the four. So the night before Christmas, <laughs> and it was really loud in the house because we were living on East 49th. It was really loud. Um, Let off Rummy know we're going to go over time. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, we got a call. I got a call from Ron Dermer, and he said, you got to get across to Hudson Yards on the other side of Manhattan. Right. And I'm looking, it's gridlock. Why? He said, there's a passport waiting for you. I said, how did this happen? He said, uh, Pompeo. Another name then we have to give right. credit to. He said, Mike Pompeo called the passport office and said, this guy is coming in. I don't care what information he gives you. Wow. You put it down in the passport wow. and you get it done. So we walked out. Esther and I walked outside. There are some good people out there. And this, the um, car came in. There's a Jamaican roll down the window and pot smoke just poured out. And I said, can you get me to the Hudson Yards? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm on the immigration office. He knew that. I said, I got 20 minutes. I, gave, I showed him a $100 bill, and I said, you get to party tonight. <laughs> if, if, if you, if can you could get, get me, me there, there. 20 he minutes. did. One-way streets, <laughs> sidewalks. You figured it's not the most dangerous stuff you could have That's a motivation. <laughs> Look, this guy was going to party that night one way or the other. So... 20 minutes later, maybe a half hour later, we walked out of the building and I had a brand new passport. Wow. And so the next day, uh, Miriam sent a beautiful car for us and we got there. We took all our stuff on the airplane because we were coming into lockdown, into Bidud. So we brought food and everything. And we got on the plane. There's no security anywhere, no customs, no police. The whole place was empty. The jet still had its motors running, so we got on and uh, took off, and everybody was clapping, and I said... No. Everybody means how many people were on that plane? Oh, Ten? About. And um, until we crossed the international line, I was expecting jets to come up and turn us around. The funny thing that happened when we landed, BB had promised Trump in writing there would be no publicity. Right. Okay, everybody was there. Right. So he's standing at the bottom of the staircase. And I turned to Esther and I said, well, I'll tell you exactly what I said. I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, the Prime Minister, Bibi is out there. What am I supposed to say? Oh, yeah. And she leaned back and she said, I'm retired. <laughs> That's it. She said, you're on your own, You're kid. on your own. <laughs> so as we were leaving the airplane, well, one of the co-pilots, they had double crew because they had to leave, ran down, and he's yelling something at B.B., pointing at the airplane. B.B.'s laughing, and he's yelling. He didn't know who he was. He thought he was groundskeeper, a groundsman. And he was yelling at him to get on the airplane and get the luggage oh off. Oh, my gosh. And B.B. is standing there laughing, and finally the co-pilot said, do you understand English? And he put his hands on B.B., and that's when the security right. came. <laughs> they so they he, set him straight. <laughs> he ran up the stairs and locked himself in the bathroom in the back of the airplane. I don't blame him. So as we left, the pilot, was an old guy, looked at me and he said, you know, who are you? He didn't have no idea who I was. And uh, I used a line that I, from a hero of mine, I said, I'm just an old Jew returning to his homeland and he looks at me and he said, you're not Meyer Lansky. <laughs> I said, you're right. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, you're here, you're right. Well, Baruch Hashem, you're not, because Lansky had a much different fate. Um, Meyer but Lansky, we don't have to get into that Meyer, now, Meyer Lansky, in what? my books, was a Jewish hero. I'm sorry. Agreed, but you'd also agree he was betrayed by the state of Israel, Yes, no? because they sent him back. Correct. I felt, um, I understood how he felt when they sent him back. I, and it was the most disgusting thing. After everything he did for Israel in 1948, 
Every, people will be amazed if they heard the mysterious nefesh that this guy had for, for Eretz Yisrael at that time. And, and what did they do? Extradited. They, throw, they extradited him. Yeah. So um, everything, there were so many op- opportunities that could have, aside, or situations that could have Aside prevented. from the BB greeting, there was also, there were some celebrations, am I right? Or not, not saying that you planned the celebrations, but were you ever, you went straight into Bidud? Straight into... Uh, and again, it was very familiar to me. Lockdown, yeah. bars. How ironic, you get to Israel yeah, and, and, and you're in lockdown. lockdown. And when I finally, you know, I'm not four hours here. I'm tired, and the door knocks. Open up the door. Someone I know in the prime minister's office. He just walks in. <laughs> Make yourself at home. So I shut the door, and Esther came out, and she looked at me, and she screamed at me. She said, you're in your underwear. And I, I'm a typical male. I just said, but they're clean. <laughs> I mean, what do you want from me? They're clean, you know. I, I don't have to, she threw a coat on me. And he said, um, I'm coming from the Rosh Hashanah. I have an offer. Um, number five. On the list? On the list. So I looked at Esther and, you know, she was making coffee. And I said, not acceptable. So he said, I've given powers to negotiate. I said, okay. I want to be number one. Just wait. So he said, Jonathan, you can't be. That's BB's that's BB slot. That's BB <laughs> slot. I said, that's what I want. You want me? It's, I want to be number one. He said, look, we're making an honest offer to you. We haven't made this offer to anyone else. This is a golden opportunity for you to, re, to integrate into the you know, halls of power, you know? to make up for the 30 years that you, you know. So I looked at him and I said, you know, for as long as I've known you, and it's been a long time, you've never lied to me until right now. What do you mean? I said, I'm the third person you offered this poison chalice to this morning. You knew this for a fact? So he said, how do you know that? I said, well, I just got it confirmed. You just guessed it. I said, it's the oldest interrogation trick in the world. I had already been called by somebody and to prepare myself that, he, that he's coming. And he's already been to two other people. Wouldn't that have been a terrible slap in the face to the United States and Trump if you'd be a member of, of government? Or At be- that particular time, you know what? If Trump had been president, no. It, it would have been okay. Um, because... I would have said the right things, you know, thank you. Right, that's true. I, my life yeah, is... Yeah, he was more concerned while he was in office. Right, right that my that's life is right. turned around. Right. I thank you. I'm, I'm going to be the best, you know, friend that the United States ever had here. Right. You know, God forbid. You know. No, I hear whatever, that. Whatever, whatever. So it, it could have been right. finessed. Um, so it, it, coming into Bidud here, into... It was, uh, I finally came out of it, and uh, the first thing I wanted to do was just walk down uh, Jaffa Street, and there was nobody there. It was kind of like a post-apocalyptic type dystopian environment. There was, except for the cats, there was just (laughs) nobody, nobody. there was nobody. And, you know, coming out of New York, where we went kind of through the same thing, you know, it was not as shocking as it could have been, but... um, yeah. Uh, amazing that you've spent this entire hour with us. I still have three personal matters I'd like to address sure. with you, if I may. Absolutely. Um, are you aware of the fact, and I'm sort of being uh, rhetorical with this because I can't imagine the answer is no. Are you aware of the fact that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews, prayed for your release? In the Mizrahi, Apollo Mizrahi, where I've been for the last 30 years, or at least when I moved into Lower Manhattan until COVID, every Shabbat, we said a Mishaberach. I said it very often. I was the leader very often. We said a Mishaberach for you. And and I must add this because you must hear this. When you were released, we refused to stop saying the Mishaberach because your wish was not to be released. Your wish was to be Babayit here in Israel. When you finally got to Israel, we declared in the synagogue, this custom is now over. 
Um, let me answer this or respond to this with a story about Esther. People would come up to her here and apologize for not doing more to help me get out. And she would look at them and she said, um, ask them, have you davened? Have you said tefillot for him? Um, yes. She said, well, Hashem has a kos shel tefillot for Yonatan in Shemaim. And when that kos is filled, he will come home. So thank you for helping. Adding to it. To, to add to that. And I th- t- want to take this opportunity to thank both you and everybody else who davened for me. But you have to understand that I have a tremendous amount of responsibility now to live up to this kind of Ahavas Yisrael by what I do here. It's not enough to just come out. You, you, people just don't come out like this and do nothing. You actually have to do something tachlis. You have to do something practical to say thank you. And I'm, I'm trying to do that now with some of my business projects that will benefit Israel. But um, come the election, the new elections, again, um, my obligation to Esther, responsibilities to her, her dying advice to me, and to everybody who davened for my release is not to compromise, right. not to bend I want people to feel good about the fact that they helped helped God release me. So, and by the way, people may be surprised I didn't focus more in this conversation about what's happening today. But this policy of yours, I think, gives everyone a perspective of what you think of today's situation and how how bending or being flexible and listening to the Americans can only be detrimental to the state of Israel. Absolutely. So I think people understand that. Yeah, we're a nation that dwells apart and we can take care of ourselves. We have a good army. As long as we remain faithful to Hashem. You would recommend not taking a penny of aid from the United States, I would assume. Ever. Ever. Right. It's like giving drugs to somebody. It's, it's, they, it reads, you, you it's, are now under their control. Yeah, well, you're, right. you're like dependent then. Right. Um, you were involved, this is the second thing I want to tell you, you were involved in one of the, one of the most interesting stories of my career without you even knowing. We, we were scheduled to come visit you. Yes. Um, you were visited by a, I think it was a congressional delegation. It was so long ago, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> another remember. Thank you. <laughs> but it was, I think it was a congressional delegation, some local elected officials, and they invited me along to come to the, uh, to the visit. And of course, I was so thrilled that I would have this opportunity to come and speak to you. The night before, now you have to remember something. I don't know if you ever heard of me before today, frankly. But you have to, oh, have you? Thank you. <laughs> okay. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you. We answered that question. <laughs> so, so the the so I, I I know who you are. Thank you very You're much. You're George Soros, aren't you? <laughs> you met you met some of my. I protégés. know all about you. You met some of my proteges. Shonda, in uh, Shonda. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm in this small radio station, college radio station, and trying to make believe that I'm a real journalist. Yeah. And, you know, doing this morning show for the Jewish world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and you know, and, and at the same time, I'm invited to come visit you the night. before before. I'll never forget this phone call. My house, we had no cell phones. I will never forget this phone call. And the night before, one of the elected officials calls me and says, the FBI, I think they said FBI, I don't know which organization would be responsible for it, has nixed your participation hmm. in this trip to Jonathan Paul. I said, why? You're a journalist. And this is, I said, you know, I've been fighting my entire well, life being taken as now, a serious journalist. All of a sudden, see, now I'm a serious you journalist. See, it's <laughs> not, not everybody that that dumps on you uh, is a bad person. And that was a good thing that happened because, um, yes, it validated the fact that you were a journalist. <laughs> I'm being polite right Thank now. Thank you. My mother uh, thanks you. <laughs> now, well, you're not a doctor or a plumber or a lawyer. That, that was actually, it was a doctor, lawyer, and plumber. That's what my mother said to me. She said, you have three options in this in country, life. plumber may be first. But plumber, right. Now, a plumber would be first. No, I mean... To interview with a journalist, what happened eventually was that the journalist and I had to sign a document 
that said that the government would retain ownership of the interview if it were an electronic interview right. and that they would apportion out what they deemed to be appropriate to the journalist and that they were not responsible for any, here it comes, misuse of the interview. So I asked Alan Dershowitz, I said, what, what does that mean? He said, they're going to cut and paste. Right. So the question that you'll be asked, do you consider yourself a traitor? They'll figure out where you said yes, and they'll just edit it in. That's what they, he said, you can't do this. It's against your First Amendment rights. So, um, okay. So, so, there, so there, we, was a, we, there was a big difference when you met with a journalist or with a sympathetic elected official. Right. It was, it, because it they was, knew it was, that the journalist conversation would become somehow part of the public record, so to correct. speak. And they correct. wanted to make sure to stop. Correct. Correct. To stop the, the information that you wanted to go out. Well, they knew I out. wasn't going to say anything. I right. shouldn't. But and I would assume there are other people in the room as this is happening, right? I would assume. Look, the, the whole thing broke when I had a journalist come to see me. And he was asking me a whole bunch of questions about the sensitivity of the information and everything else. And the, the monitors were looking, waiting, looking at me, like, how am I going to answer this? Because they were ready to come down on me for violating whatever. I thought about it, and I said, um, look, you understand that I was not indicted for intent to harm. You understand that? Yes, that's black and white. And you understand that there is some information that is so sensitive that if compromised to anybody, even the closest of friends, could inflict incalculable damage on the national security. Would you agree with that? Even if my intent were not to harm the United States, there is certain information that is so potentially damaging, which if compromised, um, would justify the imposition of a charge, an indictment of intentional harm, intent to harm. And he listened and he said, yes, okay, I understand that. So I said, so what is your conclusion by the fact that I was never charged with intent to harm? And he looked at the monitors and he looked back, he said, they're BSing. I said, thank you. And I looked at the monitor and he was trying to figure out some way of claiming that I violated security or right. whatever. And I couldn't. He, I mean, he couldn't. It's just common logic. So, okay, you're a journalist now. <laughs> you get to wear long pants. It's fine. <laughs> um, oh, you're, you no, the, you're no longer a bocher. Thank you for the approbation. <laughs> and finally, uh, for me, I saved the best for last. I, I never thought in my life I'd, I'd be able to thank you for this face-to-face, -face, personally. You, um, you were asked to speak at Shifra Hoffman's funeral. Correct. Yeah. By the way, she said paranoid Jews live longer. Agree or disagree? Oh, I, I should live at least to 120 then. I mean, even paranoid Jews have real enemies. I can't remember who <laughs> said that, but... It, it may have been her. It, as it, a, as may, a, it may have it been may her. Been the continuation yeah, of her theory. It may have been her. You, yes, spoke, I, you spoke at her funeral. At the Leviah, yeah. The next funeral after hers was for my dear friend, Mayor Weingarten. Mm. And our good friend, Carney, walked up to you, and she said the person we're about to bury had a strong connection to you. I don't remember the exact word she used when she introduced it. And you said, what do you mean? So she said that he, meaning Mayor, my closest friend, who we lost, unfortunately, a couple of years ago suddenly, Mayor had 15 seconds with President Bill Clinton mm. to say, say to him, ask him whatever he wanted. As many people do, you go to a meeting with the president and everyone has a chance to walk by him, shake his hand and say something, right? I met George Bush, what did I say to him? I said, thank you for what you do for Israel and the Jewish people. Was it the right thing to do? I don't know, but that's what came to my mind that I oh, said it. A... Okay. Mayor Weingarten, Carney says to you, we have this on video, by the way. Carney says to you, Yigal was right there. He was right next to you when this happened waiting for the funeral to start. Carney says to you that Mayor, our dear friend Mayor Weingarten, who, by the way, had a, an apartment right here on Rokhov Jabotinsky, he, he, he saw President Clinton for 15 seconds and used the opportunity to ask him to do everything in his power to free 
Jonathan Pollard. You said to Carney in response, I hope that stands in good measure in Shemayim. I wish our leaders had the kind of courage as, had the kind of courage as Mayer had. You said this with his name. Every time a Jew shows, this is you speaking, mm-hmm. every time a Jew shows no fear and stands up for his brothers and sisters, that's Achtus. You told a story then to her from Kever Yosef mm-hmm. with a soldier that you were with at Kever Yosef. And that, based on that episode, you said, this is how we know we're going to win. Correct. Because of the Achtus and unity, which by the way, if there is any positive byproduct of this war, you'd have to agree. I'm on record as saying that. The Achtus and That if there is a silver lining to this otherwise black event, um, it's that people now are together and their eyes are open. You said, you continued, we know the expression, the slogan, you, in our tradition, you save one life, you save a world. And then you concluded by saying to her, and I felt you said this to all of us who were his friends, I would have been there if not for COVID. You were very privileged and lucky to know him. Mm. Can't thank you enough for that. Um, from one Jew to another, yeah. And he spends the 15 seconds <laughs> concerned about you. Um, we ha- if we don't, if you cannot feel the pain of your brother or sister as if it's your own. If you can't feel the pain of the land as is violated by our enemies, and if you can't feel the fear of our children when they have 15 seconds or 20 seconds to run to a bomb shelter to escape a rocket, then I really question your lineage. You have to be willing to put your life on the line if necessary for your brothers and sisters. You have to. We don't live for the present. We live for Shemaim. And so when you run across people like this, you have to say, Baruch Hashem. There was somebody that stood up. There was somebody that was a starker yid. There was somebody that wouldn't bend, that, that defended our good name and our people, which he did. There are lots of good Jews that I've come to know, yourself included, that I think are going to have to ask some very hard questions of themselves over the coming days, weeks, and months. And what is that question? The question is, is it the right time now to come home? People tell me, and I got this all the time in New York, we're waiting for Moshiach. And Esther, alayhi shalom, gave me the appropriate response to people like that. And what is it? Maybe he's waiting for us. And coming home now, I think, is imperative. The galut, especially in America, was good for a while. It was okay. But it's... You're an American from Texas. You got it. Yeah. But... um, Y'all got to come home now. Here, <laughs> y'all got to come home. That's what they say in Galveston. Yeah, y'all, y'all have to come home now. Actually, it's, I hate to keep telling funny stories. It wrecks the whole thing. My wife, Rivka, comes from Birmingham. I said, Alabama? And she said, no, England. <laughs> you thought nobody, you had a southerner nobody, there. <laughs> nobody comes from Birmingham, Alabama. I mean, British friends of mine from London or Manchester say, where? Okay. And she has a very peculiar accent. And when she gets on a roll, I really, I honestly, I, which is good for a husband. Yeah, sometimes I it's better, I just say, right? yes, yes, dear, and that's it. You know, I don't know what she's asking. So I said to her, look, let me explain how I used to talk. And it's taken me 40 years almost to, to, to lose the accent. <laughs> so I went through it, and she just looked at me and said, my Lord. You've lost about 100 IQ points in my life. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, all right. Come to Texas and you'll see how much lower it can be. Um, but just in conclusion, is, is seriousness. Um, it's time to come home. When 
this kind of brutal anti-Semitism is now mainstream and is not being opposed um, by anybody, the police, um, government, government, academia. No, nobody. It's like accepted. It's mainstream. That's when you know, you know, you don't want to wait until it's crystal clear. Right. If we know anything from Jewish history. If we know anything from Jewish history, it's that the, the trials and tribulations of our past in Galut are embedded in our genes. Even as estranged as we might be from Judaism and from the Am, it's still there. The Pintele Yid still has that. And you have to listen to it because it may mean your life. It may mean your life. So learn from history and pack up rationally, carefully, slowly, and come home. This is home where they may not like you, but it won't be because you're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Pollard, I can't thank you enough. My pleasure. Lashana Hazot be Yerushalayim. Toda Raba Raba. Toda Raba to you. Achenu be Yisrael and Achim Achem, our brothers and sisters in Israel. We are with you. This is America's one and only Jewish Moments in the Morning Radio program, heard on listeners sponsored digital radio around the world, the web, and AlchemSiegel.com on the AlchemSiegel Network, and of course on the beloved NSN app. My thanks to Jonathan Pollard. My thanks to all of you. Plenty coming up here. We're a little bit behind schedule, but we're We'll catch up at some point. Plenty coming up on a Thursday, as we always say. No need to touch that dial when you're listening to the NSN Network. Tomorrow morning, plenty more, including our weekly update. And, of course, Rabbi Yudin and uh, Harry Rothenberg on Parshas Vayigash. And tomorrow's a fast day. Keep that in mind. We'll be in Jerusalem, literally broadcasting until Shabbos begins. Make sure to be tuned in. Have a fabulous Thursday. Till tomorrow, Nachum Siegel reminding you, remember the past, live the present, and trust the future. You had some inspiring messages wow. about Tony. And is that what you did? You everyone straight there? Yeah.